we had a, a homing device that the modern agent, the modern technology, radar, nothing can come up with it. It's actually human. It's your nose. We had a homing device called our nose. We had a paper mill down at Caravan. We had a paper mill at St. Joe. We had a paper mill at Panama City. We had a paper mill up at Pensacola. Well, when a paper mill belches out that sulfur fumes, they're yellowish. They make two different colors when you're in a fog. And you have the yellow and you have the white. And the minute you hit that yellow, man, you can smell it. If you have a north wind or an east wind or a northeast wind coming out over the gulf from the shore, they laid out just like beams. And they didn't separate. They stayed together. Even you could be out 30 or 40 miles, that beam wouldn't be over two or three miles wide. That smoke would stay right together. So we'd be flying along. Well, that's St. Joe. Then pretty soon we'd fly a little bit further. There's Panama City. Yep, that's right. We could be detected if it was number one, two, or three, or four. And we had those. But we did have some adversities flying down there. There were also called gunnery schools at Pensacola at Eglin Field, at Tyndall Field, at Panama City, and Apalachicola, the Navy had a uh, gunnery school. Well, those gunners, in the back end of that plane that they were practicing firing at that sleeve from another, they were in two AT-6s, and they'd be firing, firing this gun at that sleeve, a 30 or 50 caliber, and they'd be firing away. They wouldn't look any further than that sleeve. They wouldn't look beyond. Well, down there under that fog, there we go merrily along, practicing and getting ready to do our escort missions. Well, and behold you, uh, it kind of took us back when you'd see a burst of machine gun fire go across in front of you in the water. You'd say, Brr! somebody up there is firing. Well, still to this very day, I think two of our fellows were killed by friendly fire. Uh, we couldn't help but think that's what happened. I had flown the plane they were in about three or four days before, and it was a perfect, it was a brand new plane, it was Cessna Airmaster. And coming into Panama City, they were on their last square they were working before they came into Panama City. This is further down in our patrols. Uh, the other plane, we always flew in twos, a slow plane and a fast plane. The slow plane held the on course, the fast plane would do the porpoise out and back out and back. That's how we would scan a block. We'd do that all the way around the block until we were sure there was nothing in that block area that we were patrolling. And then we'd move off to the next block. Well, the plane that was doing the porpoising happened to just complete his turn and was coming back toward the on-course plane when he seen it just slow roll over on his back and right down. Well, all our flying was done at 400 feet off the water. But 400 feet, you don't have much time for correction. They just rolled over and went in. And that was kind of a sad thing. We had two that had mid air collisions in the fall. And we lost two fellows there. We had two others that were lost over land, our base. After they armed our planes, we no longer could fly over any city whatsoever or any populated area. We even had to be careful what beach area we were flying. We couldn't fly over the Wayne White Wright shipyards, or later became the Kaiser shipyard. Nobody trusted those bomb racks that we had on there. <laughs> Down between your legs, you have the control stick or the control yoke on an airplane. But then we had a ring on the floor. It was about this big around. And all you do is slip your finger through that and you could pull that. We had the army wire fastened to the frame of the uh, bomb rack. And all you had to do was pull that and your bomb would let loose. Well, Bob Dodd said we needed practice. Well, when you're flying along in a plane at about 165 miles an hour, and you drop that bomb at 400 feet, that bomb for a while rides right along with you. It's also doing the same speed that you are. When it drops and goes off, kaboom, you're right over top of the explosion. So we had to figure out how to get out of that mess. Well, we didn't have time to pull up to make a regular bomb run, so we decided let's do a wing over right at the time we release that bomb and get away from that. And so he said, you guys got to have practice then. 
that there was a little island off the end of the runway out in St. Andrews Bay. It wasn't very big. It was about maybe eight, nine, ten times the size of this room. We went out and we laid out the exact dimensions of a submarine. Then we took some gasoline drums and made the coning tower. That became our, and we cleared off the area around. We lined up with rocks all the way around. So we would know the exact dimensions of the sub. That became our practice. And I was pretty good at hitting. We had a dummy charges in 100 pound demos. They put a dummy charge in, which wouldn't blow up huge. It would just be a powder puff, more or less, when we hit. And we had plenty of, plenty of practice bombs. Well, in December of 44, the first part of December of 44, I was assigned dawn patrol toward Mobile. Mobile was the end of our line that we had to patrol. The guys coming up, New Orleans and Beaumont, covered the area onto the west of that. We had to go down to almost Cedar Key, is where we had to fly. We had the islands, we had Sand Blau Point to cover, and all that area. Well, in December, my co-pilot, we were flying through a heavy fog, in and out. We were just brushing the treetops as it was as I was going up to Mobile Bay. And I was flying the coast. I knew all the high points and knew where all the high trees were, so I was staying clear of them. He said, something's moving back here. I said, oh, you're kidding me. He said, yeah, something's moving back here. Just as we came out over the east side of Mobile Bay. So we did a 360, came back around, sure enough. German sub was making a run for the pass. Well, we lost him in the fog again. We made another circle. I called the other plane to come in immediately, and I told him exactly where we were and to fall in back of us. And we came out, and here he had gone through the pass on us. And at Mobile, you have two gigantic sandbars. You've got to clear that first one because it's only about, oh, six or seven fathoms down at uh, first sandbar. The second sandbar is a little further out. It's about a quarter of a mile out. And when they have real wet summers or wet, wet springs, that second sandbar generates itself and becomes large. The captain's chart apparently didn't show that. And they started their dive. Or they thought they were in the deep part of the gulf. And they started their dive called Wham. They hit that second bar. And there his props were out of water, and they were in like this, and we laid an egg right beside him. <laughs> they said we cracked the seam on the front part of that. Well, that sub was on in Mobile Bay on display on the West Bank near the city for over 40 years. They finally taken it away, and they took and placed a nuclear sub there. If you're down to see the battleship Alabama, you can see the nuclear sub. It's on display there, and they got some other artifacts from World War II there. That was the first sub that we actually got, and we captured it. But we put in a call immediately to the Coast Guard and to the Navy. And I will say this for this Coast Guard boy, he found a big chain on the back of their boat. He was on a sea tug. And they weren't too far away from us. They were only about five minutes away. And they come up and he manually picked that big heavy chain up and they got close enough to the back of that sub that he threw that into their props, that chain. Well, that really fouled up their engines, but good. Well, then the Navy is the one that was in charge of getting it surfaced and getting the crew off. They're some of the first internees that we had from World War II. I believe, I was told once, they were sent to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, I believe it is, is where they were interned at. But we found on that sub, fresh bread from the New Orleans Breaker. We found newspapers that were brand new from both Mobile and New Orleans. We found all kinds of things that dated that they had just taken on their supplies. Well, they were in a quiet part of Mobile Bay where nobody would venture there, only fishermen. Back in the days when they could fish out there, fishermen would drive their cars or trucks out there and park and then go fishing. Apparently, they had contacts. And none of you people realize that we had thousands and thousands of German sympathizers in, this, in the area of the Gulf of Mexico and up the East Coast at the beginning of World War II. It was so easy for the Germans to make a contact. Jackie and I, when we were married, April the 2nd, 
1943. We lived just up the road, not further than from here uptown, from the old Dutch tavern. A wonderful place to get a beer and a sandwich, or seafood, practically nothing. You could get seafood all you wanted to eat. And we would go down there of an evening, and for 50, 75 cents, you could fill up completely. And we would go there. Lo and behold, you about three weeks after we lived at Larkway Villas, the Coast Guard advised us that he had been taken in by the Coast Guard. They caught him one night about 2 o'clock in the morning coming in in his power boot. He had a big inlet there close to the restaurant. He'd been going out and servicing the submarines with eating supplies with different things. Well, once in a while, a military plane would take off from the lower part of Florida, flying to Texas, either San Antonio or Dallas or one of those places. And <coughs> crossing the Gulf, the military plane would notice there was a trawler way out in the middle of the Gulf. Well, the problem was at the beginning of the war, the ships would leave and go directly over to Key West. At Key West, they would form into their convoy. Part of the convoy would go to Natal, which was going to North Africa. The other part of the convoy would go up the East Coast. Well, we found out if they would pull away from the center of the Gulf, there's a continental shelf that goes clear around the Gulf of Mexico. There's a continental shelf that goes up along the eastern seaboard. Your water is not too terribly deep. It's dangerous for a submarine to operate in that shallow water. So we said, let's pull our convoys in over the continental shelf. Put them within a 20-mile limit of shore. Well, <coughs> that worked for just a little while till we find out at night, with your cities being lit up, they could stand out in the deep and the silhouette of the ship would show up and they could fire at it. So the blackout zone came in. We had to black out everything. We had to get big heavy drapes to put down. Or we used tar paper that we used on our windows of Arcway Bella. Your headlights had to be blacked out on your car. You had a one inch headlight. You didn't want to go any place at night. You couldn't see anything. Anyway, you had one inch headlight in case of emergency and you had to drive so you want the other driver to see your lights. All the lights in the hotels, all the lights in the town, everything were cut off. It was dark as pitch, and that's the situation we were under down there for a period of about 12 months. Really the first, the real bad period was the first 10 months. Up here I have before me a few things that happened at the CAP base. I was at CAP base 14 at Panama City. As each of these bases were open, they were given a number. <coughs> we had a total of 21 from Maine, from Bar Harbor, Maine, to Brownsville, Texas, scattered out along the coast. But the reason we had to have them, the Navy only had four blimps at the time. Four! Four blimps for the whole United States Navy that were stationed at Lake Hurst, New Jersey. They could only patrol down a ways on the Atlantic coast and up a ways on the Atlantic coast. That made it extremely hard. We didn't have anything but World War I destroyers. We didn't have any modern day destroyers. Our good destroyers were out in the Pacific, what's left of them after Pearl Harbor. But we had several fleet operations operating. We couldn't rescue anybody. Those poor devils at Philippine Islands, we couldn't get a crew to, I uh, couldn't get a, an armada to them. Uh, when we had a chance there on Wake Island to go in, go after them and on wait, we should have done it, but we didn't. We never want to see ourselves in that condition again, where we have no military, or no army, no navy, no marine, that you can fall back on. Our aircraft was antiquated as the devil. We had P-36s and P-40s, were our first line fighters. They had the P-51s and the P-47s on the drawing board, but they haven't been completely tested and come out. So lo and behold, you, we were stymied right there. Well, on April the 2nd, 43, that's the following spring, I wanted my wife to come down with me, I mean my girlfriend to come down with me to my brothers in Atlanta, Georgia. And I said, please, if you can, make arrangements with your folks. I'll pay for the ticket to fly down to Atlanta. Well, if you weren't married, you didn't go nowhere. Her folks put their thumb down and that was it. You're not going to Atlanta, Georgia by yourself and be there. Well, my father was 